Uh, my name is Sally Campbell. I work for Bookmarks Publications and I'll be chairing the session. Um, we've got three excellent speakers uh, on the panel tonight. Uh, first of all, we've got Alex Kalinikos, who's a leading member of the city. Revolutionary Ideas of Karl Marx. We also have um, John Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities at the Autonomous University in Pueblo, Mexico. He's the author, um, probably most famously, of Change the World Without Taking Power, of which there's a new edition coming in September. And also his most recent book is Crack Capitalism. Um, and finally, we have Slavoj Žižek. Uh, <laughs> he's been philosopher author of dozens of books, and the latest is Living in the End Times. Um, I'm going to introduce each of the speakers um, to, to put their case. Um, while they're doing that, members of the team in the red t-shirts will be going around the speaker slip. So for the thousand people in this room who want to contribute or ask a question or, or put a point to any of our speakers, uh, please take a slip, fill it in and hand it in. So after they've all introduced um, the topic, we'll open it up then to the discussion from the floor. So first of all, I'll introduce Alex Lennox. Thanks very much. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was visiting South Africa, and I, I went to the, here, uh, the Museum of Apartheid in Johannesburg, which is a fantastic record of the whole system of racial oppression in, in South Africa. And halfway through going round to the museum, I burst into tears. And the reason why I did was because I realised that apartheid, this whole institutionalised system of oppression, had been reduced to items in a museum. I, for, for the first few decades of my life, I was brought up uh, on the assumption that a, apartheid was part of the permanent furniture of the world. And suddenly, I was brought up with something that I'd known intellectually, but was experiencing emotionally, that apartheid, this dense system of oppression, had gone. Of course, that leaves many other evils in the world, but that particular <coughs> form of oppression had gone, and it was a wonderful moment. Now, what I'd like to do one day, and it may be in a few decades' time, um, rather bent and on a stick, is to go to a museum of capitalism. <laughs> As a party, but that poses the question: what, Where would I be uh, if, if I went to uh, a museum of, of capitalism? And the answer is in communism, in a communist society. Now, because more than anything else, communism is the name of the alternative to to, to to capitalism. I want to say something about the classical Marxist understanding of, of communism, but it's an idea that has been returned returned at least to intellectual debate in the past few years, particularly as a result of the interventions by Slavoj over there and by the uh, French uh, philosopher Alain Badiou. And I think this is a very useful thing to have happened because we're confronted with an extremely serious and I think protracted crisis of capitalism and therefore we need to be talking not about regulating capitalism, not about reforming capitalism, but by replacing it with something completely different. And communism is about the alternative. The idea of communism is about the idea of the alternative to, to, to capitalism. So, what is communism? Now, Marx and Engels gave uh, a classic definition of, of communism in the Communist Manifesto, and they said, for us, communism is the real movement that abolishes the present state of things. And I think that that's a very important idea there. That communism uh, isn't, for Marx at least, primarily an, an idea. Communism is the actual revolutionary process that abolishes capitalism. And implied in that is 
a degree of skepticism about too much discussion of the idea of communi- communism, as opposed to the development, as Martin Engels put it, of real movements that can begin to destroy it as a system. But of course that isn't all that Marx says about communism. He called, in capital, he calls communism the rule of the associated producers. In other words, those who, who perform the labour, those who produce the wealth, collectively taking control of the productive resources of society. And in the critique of the Goethe programme, he um, talks about the kind of principle that would govern a communist society. And this, he says, would be the principle of from each according to his abilities and to, to each according to his, his needs, which is, if you think, of, think about it, a rad- radically egalitarian principle. You distribute on the basis of what people need and you demand from people not what you're prepared to pay them, not, in other words, you don't get people to participate in production on the basis of material incentives, you get them to participate on the basis of what abilities they can bring to the whole process of producing things. Now, I don't think Marx's very limited discussions of communism are the end of the story by any means, apart from anything else, because of Marx's critique of utopian socialism, in other words, of constructing ideal schemes of a, um, of a, of a communist communist society, he says, I think, just too little about what a communist society would be like, and that's a discussion that we need to, need to continue. But it seems to me that fundamentally, in those relatively brief intuitions that we find in Marx, we get a, the basis of, of a good understanding of communism. And it seems to me better than some of the things that have been put around in the, the current debates, like Badiou in his writings on communism, vacillates between a very abstract notion of communism as the essentially the idea of equality, which seems to be much too abstract because it says nothing about how production is organised. Alternatively, he's very he's much too concrete because he talks about he moves from talking about communism with a small c, the alternative to capitalism to talking about communism with a capital C, in other words, actually existing communist parties who more often than not are Stalinist parties compromised by all sorts of very fundamental failures. And I think there are two things that are missing from Badiou's discussion. First of all, the critique of political economy, because when Marx talks about the real movement for the abolition of the present state of things, the soil from which that real movement grows, the grounding for any, any real movement towards communism is provided by capitalist society and its contradictions. And Badiou says nothing about that. Secondly, what's missing from Badiou's discussion of communism is self-emancipation. The self-emancipation of the working class that was central to Marx's conception of how society would be transformed. In other words, the achievement of communism is the act of the oppressed and exploited themselves. No one else can do it for them. Now, turning to Slavoj and and John, I think that they both certainly agree about the necessity of the critique of political economy. Um, I'm sure that John agrees about self-emancipation, although I think we have different understandings of self-emancipation. I'd be interested to know what Slavoj Thought, thought about that, because it seems to be critical to any notion, notion of a genuine communist transformation, or the actuality of a communist transformation. But I think there is a point uh, on which we do disagree, and I want to spend the last um, time that I have, how much have I got left? Uh, seven. seven minutes, good, that should be enough. Talking about something that, where I think we will, will disagree, which is that contemporary discussions of communism tend to focus on the idea of the commons, which is a very widespread idea on the radical, r- radical left around, around the world. And very often people talk, uh, so powerful is the idea of the commons, that people talk about communism as opposed to communism. Now what's the idea here? The idea is that there's lots of good stuff in the world, uh, either natural resources or human creativity in its fruits. And these, this good stuff is essentially, in some sense, collectively owned. 
And the problem is that capitalism comes along and pinches all this good stuff and turns it to its own purposes. And that's fundamentally what's, not simply what's wrong with capitalism, but what drives capitalism. Now, of course it's true that there is lots of good stuff in the world that is a product of collective action or is collectively appropriated in some sort of way. And it's absolutely true that capitalism is coming along all the time and pitching. Marx talks about the primitive accumulation of capital, the original seizure of key productive resources that makes capitalism possible as a system. But John and David Harvey and other people have stressed that this, this uh, appropriation of what's commonly owned uh, is a continuing reality of capitalism. It's not just something that happened in the past. It's something that goes on all the time. But I think it's a mistake simply to reduce what capitalism does to that. And there are people who do that. I'm not saying that either Slavoj or John does, but for example, Hart and Negri do. For example, in their most recent book, Commonwealth. And the effect... Um, what they essentially do is reduce capitalism to the appropriation of the, of, of the commons. And what that means is capitalism is essentially an external parasitic force that comes along and seizes things and use, turns it to its own pur purposes. This, I think, is a profound misunderstanding of Marx, and more importantly, a profound misunderstanding of, of capitalism. Because for Marx, capital insists on this, is a social relation. And it's a social relation defined by, fundamentally, all sorts of other things, the exploitive relationship between capital and wage labour. And the relationship between capital and wage labour is an internal, it's an intrinsic one. Each of the parties to the relationship, the workers who are exploited and the capitalists who, are exploit, who exploit them, are defined socially by the, the connection um, uh, with, with, e with each other. Why, do, why does it matter? I mean, this may sound like a, a weird bit of kind of philosophical abstraction that I'm in, engaging in. It matters because it helps us to understand what's happening in capitalism today. Let's look at China, the, the kind of fantasy world of the apologists of, of capitalism. If we look at what's happening in China today, of course it's true that commons have been appropriated and in all sorts of ways that newly developing private capitalist class uh, establishes itself as a social and economic force by grabbing collectively owned land, stealing all sorts of stuff and so on. But that's not what's critical to what's happening in China. What we see in China is a process of very rapid capital, capitalist development that involves an enormous creation and expansion of human productive capabilities by bringing workers together in conditions where they're collectively exploited. There's this place called Foxconn, um, which is an extraordinary company which produces an awful lot of the iPads and iPods and iPhones and so on that everyone desires so, so much, which involves one complex in the southeast of China where 300,000 workers are employed in the same factory, factory, factory town. That's crucial to the kind of capitalist development that is, 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 is taking place in China. Um, and you know, what it involves is a vast expansion in human productive capabilities, but on the basis of the most intensive ex exploitation. What this means is, and this is something that Marx is very insistent on, that communism isn't just um, a, a, about taking back what capital stole what those collectively owned resources that pre-existed the, 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 the formation of the cap, capital relation. What mm, communism, much more importantly, is, is, a, is about is seizing the productive capacities that are created within the framework of the cap, capital relation. Marx has this marvellously contradictory view of capitalism as a disastrous and destructive force but also an enormous expansion in human productive powers, which revolution is about take, taking, taking control of. Why does this matter politically? It matters politically because ultimately it comes down to the question of, of power. As I said, the relationship between capital and wage labour 
is an internal one. Exploiter and exploiter are bound together in this intimate relationship of interdependence. Interdependence, that's critical. In other words, the worker you know, depends upon the capitalist because the worker only owns his or her labour power. The worker has to go and work for a capitalist to be exploited and all that sort of thing. But there's another side to that. The capitalist depends on the worker. The worker's labour is the source of the capitalist profits. When the worker's labour stops, then capitalism stops. And this isn't just an abstract proposition. Because again, let's go back to the case of China, the so-called future of capitalism. What we've seen in recent weeks are explosions of strikes by this new working class. Processes of production, extracting massive pay, pay increases, shifting the whole relation of power between capital and wage labour. And that's the bottom line of, about, co about communism. And actually it's an idea that pre-exists Marx that goes back to Blanqui and the radical French communists that what the force that is going to a, a, achieve communism is precisely that mass of wage labourers who are expressed who are pressed and exploited by capitalism, but precisely because they're exploited, have the capacity to carry through this revolution that can take us out of capitalism to communism. Mark, when you said you were down there in South Africa and then you started first into cry, uh, 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 crying, I thought because you didn't understand to German yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I also didn't yeah. you know, to share our uh, opposition to cheap patriotism. When Slovenia lost to England, my son was almost beaten by his peers because he was for England. So we are all here, but let me go to the more serious part. Uh, 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 yes, I share deeply your wonderful idea of this looking at ourselves from the future museum of capitalism. But the first bad news we have today, I was in a couple of them is that, you know, unfortunately, museums of communism already exist. <laughs> in practically all post-socialist Eastern European countries, I visited one in Budapest, for example, when I bought a wonderful thing, a candle as a figure of Stalin, and then you light a candle. <laughs> <laughs> critique of Badiou, that is to say, his total conscious, you cannot accuse him that he didn't see it, he is absolutely consciously opposed to it, of the very notion that critique of political economy has a place, a direct place, in what he calls idea of communism. My point here would have been simply that one should what one should do with regard to Badiou is, because Badiou is here, although he denies it, obviously Kantian. He even calls in his communist hypothesis the idea of communism a kind of Kantian regulative idea. And he absolutely opposes any too narrow mediation between this idea and uh, actual social life. For him, this is really historicism. You fall into the historicist trap. What I think is that we should pass here from Kant to Hegel. Hegel, for Hegel, idea is something which is not just an ideal opposed to reality, but something which has in itself the power of its own actualization, which may sound ultra-idealist, but it's exactly what Marx says in what you refer to him, that, that is to say, to conceive the idea of communism as a real movement. Maybe our small differences begin with where to locate this real movement. Uh, let me begin with some quite empirical remarks. You know, I was in China when this happened, three, four weeks ago when this strikes started, and maybe this is a manipulation what I was told there. 
But I wasn't told by official representatives. I was told by this, maybe you know them, one query and other critical intellectuals. They told me that these strikes were strictly tolerated even up to a point, hopefully, incited by the Communist Party, as part, they think that the only way to cut a long story short for China to retain its economic momentum in a situation of worldwide crisis is to insist the purchase power of the local working class. So for them, they are maybe a little bit too cynical. They say, of course, this discontent with strikes was all the time there. The mystery for them is why all of a sudden were strikes not only tolerated, but even positive, that was for them the big sign, positively reported in the media. You know, till now, if you mention the word independent trade unions, before you finish the sentence, to put it in that text, ironic way, you already had a one-way ticket train to Mongolia, to some camp. All of a sudden, now, my dog strikes get positive mention in the official media. But my modest counter-example to you would have been precisely China. What my friends there are trying to convince me is that exploited as they are, and I totally agree with you, this Fox Sport story is ridiculous. The nicest part of the story is this one. It was reported, I hope you know it probably better than me in the media. You know how Foxconn reacted? It's ridiculous. It's the best of the brutal cynicism of what we call patriarchal caring charity, human relations, capitalism. You know how Foxconn reacted to this wave of suicides? Three things. First, all people who work for Foxconn had to sign anti-suicidal pact. It's a pact so promising the day of human. <laughs> Second, this is not a joke, that's so crazy about it. Second point, now this we got more into Orwellian ominous waters. They had also to sign a legal obligation that if they see their fellow worker like depressed in a suicidal mood, that they will denounce him to the factory of oil. <laughs> so they can call a psychiatrist. And the last measure, it's not a joke. Because as you said, these are gigantic factories, they don't have enough space. Most of the work happens in high-rise buildings, which is why the suicides are mostly done by jumping through windows. This is not a joke. They are putting large nets, nets work. <laughs> I am the first one to agree with you. But what nonetheless they told me is that, and this is the tragedy of the situation, that in spite of all of this, those who can move to these big industrial cities like Shanghai and others consider themselves up to a point, even the lucky ones. The true problem is background, and there there we have a totally different situation of these half unemployed farmers, and maybe this is at least as important a movement. This is why I think maybe we should show a little bit more mercy towards China. Maybe I was told that these poor farmers who are left behind by this capitalist explosion are starting to organize themselves and organize themselves in Chinese numbers. A kind of a self created network, we are talking about tens, according to some. Uh, uh, sources even 100, 200 of millions of people. Autonomous farmer self-organization and the Communist Party, not for any good democratic reason, but because they think that if they oppress this, there is an even stronger ex explosion. At a certain point, is seriously considering the possibility of allowing them, of recognizing them at least as some kind of a partner. Maybe this is just an old fascist formula, corporate organization, maybe it's something more. But where I maybe don't quite agree, now I come to basically, first, I think uh, you were a little bit unfair, although I criticize him all the time, I'm ready to take the blame for the commons, to work Tony Negri, because he would concede all this. You know, exploitation, new subjectivity, exploited by capital. What I am claiming is something, and I will try to put it as brutally and openly as possible so that I expose myself to the counterattack. What I am claiming is that to grasp, I repeat what I, the claim I made here the last year, that to grasp today, today's capitalist dynamics, this logic of exploitation is no longer enough. That again, to grasp 
the capitalist dynamic, you need to take into account first the new role, important role as a source of wealth of raw materials, which for Marx were basically out of the equation. You know, the irony is that when Marx, Cheta in Capital, wants to demonstrate that raw materials cannot be a source of wealth in the sense of value, of course, he, you know what he gives as an example? Oil. So, to provoke you, I already was interrupted a year ago, I like to repeat the provocation. I think something very simple. If you apply dogmatically Marx to today's Venezuela, you cannot but say that Chavez is exploiting the United States. He is not. But that's why we have to rethink it. One thing are raw materials, which are an important part of the struggle, so we confront them. Another one is so-called intellectual property, and that for me the problem of commons is crucial. Again, my vulgar example, which I used a year ago. How did that creep, who is now happily on the way down, uh, Bill Gates, how did he become, at least at some point, the, the wealthiest man in the world? I don't believe in the classical Marxist explanation of, you know, extreme, extra, extra, super profit exploitation. I think we should return to the category of rent which is still some kind of exploitation, but different. I think uh, Bill Gates is not so rich because he especially has exploited his workers or whatever, but because, again, he appropriated part of what should be and in a way even is our commons. Each of us, when we want to be in touch in a shared public space, you have to pay to him the price just so that we can share the same deal through internet, social space, and so on and so on. This is for me the logic of the privatization of the commons. It has something to do... Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> I will overcome this big heart attack and go on. Yes. It has something, I think, to do with the big problem of what Marx called general intellect. Well, I think Marx is at his best, you remember in Grundrisse, where Marx says, how, uh, uh, how uh, the moment the knowledge, collective practical knowledge, will become the main source of wealth, capitalism will dissolve. He comes very close to some kind of almost economic determinism. I think what Marx didn't take into account is the possibility of this general knowledge, collective practical knowledge, productive knowledge, being reprivatized again. This is why I think that although I agree with you, commons were enclosed all the time, I nonetheless agree with those who claim that today we have a new, much more radical, maybe even uh, unthinkable for Marx, twist in this story. So this was the introduction, now the shorter part, the main part. What I, okay, I will just enumerate points for you, since I am, again, as I always emphasize, the victim of a brutal, metaphysical, linear notion of time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you see what communism, I'm still absolutely for communism, but what this means is that we, the left, really have to take into account the amount of the failure of 1990. What I think is that not only did a certain Stalinist state socialism disintegrate, now with a 20 years delay, we are getting that also welfare state social democracy loss is slowly disappearing. And I would add to provoke you something which probably you will not agree, but it's my crucial point, that, you know, all those who were criticizing these twin brothers of two versions of state socialism, Western democratic welfare state and uh, Stalinist, uh, usually do it from a position of a dream of councils, Soviets, immediate democracy, and so on and so on. I claim that that one also has to be abandoned. That this was the big dream which died different deaths, Chinese Cultural Revolution, 68, and so on and so on. I claim this is an illusion. The idea that somehow the authentic working class will awaken in some kind of direct democracy and so on. Second point. When we are anti-capitalists here, now I hope here at least we will all agree. Did you notice how today we even have, as my Indian friend Shao Igiri recently told me, wonderful expression, an overload of the critique of the horrors of capitalism. Nothing is easier than to be anti-capitalist today. In all the media you are bombarded, that corrupted banker, that, that, uh, uh, that company which is polluting the environment, that company 
company which is using child slave labor and so on and so on. It's elementary to say what is wrong here. You can be as much anti-capitalism as you want, but this ethical anti-capitalism always personifies it with, you know, that corrupted, that corrupted. They often say that the question is the question of the system. Even Obama, to whom I still have at least a certain minimal respect, deeply disappointed me here. How did Obama react to BP oil spill? I'm not paid by British Petroleum. I also think they are disgusting. What I'm saying is that it's, you see, we have a great natural catastrophe with unpredictable consequences. Instead of approaching it in a radical way, mobilizing all the people, maybe even the army, at least if the US army in this way would have been doing something more meaningful than killing the Afghanis, no? Uh, what is he doing? He changed it into a typical legal, private, immoral culprit uh, problem. As it, I will keep the BP in the ass and I will make them pay, which is totally ridiculous. You can see here how we cannot do it. Because ecology, the amount of crises which are technically ahead of us, they absolutely need something that I cannot by call, but call a communist approach. That is to say, a large mobilization outside the market and outside this legal state form. So, uh, uh, again, uh, the problem for me is the following one of communism. I hope we also here we all agree. This basic insight of Marx that the problem of freedom, the true side of the problem of freedom, is not the political system. You know, all this me measurement done by Western agencies who, in a patronizing way, measure third world countries. Do you have free elections? Do you have independent judges and so on? The true measure of freedom is what goes on in what superficially appears as an uh, apolitical set of civil society relations, production, exploitation, even family, and so on and so on. There, in this, not directly, of course they are in reality political, political, their freedom is decided. Which is why I think that this cheap anti-capitalism, oh how corrupted they are, BP, this company, that, still implicitly, yes, remains within the scope of this legal approach. We need to expand political democracy to cover it up and so on and so on. It cannot be done. Okay, I will now really shut it up because I would like maybe to engage in a debate with you, John, with your legendary statement, which I hope maybe I misunderstood about the local level. Let's our properly at this local level and somehow now I am not sure I got you correctly. The way you are radically interpreted is, you know, it's like this what Hegel would have called uh, subterranean uh, work of uh, uh, slow work so that you don't have to confront the power directly, you just do this local work. We don't need to take power, but some, well, well to be very brutal and really to sum it up. My problem is one that I read your work. No, no, the KGB did it. I have it in black book. <laughs> All the examples that you, this is an empirical claim, please, I would like to be refuted. This is not a rhetorical stupidity. All, all examples that you enumerate, I claim, still presuppose not only a relatively strong, but even a relatively efficient state, I claim. Yes, I claim. Show me, uh, that, uh, you know, you can have all these local communities doing their work is always in the background, uh, uh, the state remains. Second point, what to do then when, to put it in very naive terms, how literally am I to take, yes, stop, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm huh? stopping, it's a very little problem. <laughs> Yeah, this is impossible. Just to conclude, Rico, uh, yeah, <laughs> 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 I 
I, I see the red letter and you are winning. <laughs> Did you notice how, in what a strange way, the signifier impossible functions in our ideological space? On the one hand, the official ideology is telling us everything is becoming almost possible, you know, in the field of private pleasure, science, and so on. We will be able to change our character. We will be able not to mention what horrible things in sexuality doing. We will be able to travel to the moon. Everything is possible there. But the moment you approach social relations, there are more and more things which are impossible, you know. As if the message of the ruling ideology will be able to travel to the moon, to Venus, will be able to become immortals, of course, why not? But will it be possible to change a little bit the healthcare care legislation? No, no way it doesn't. <laughs> Opposition today, and our message should be, of course, not in an irrational sense, but in the sense of what appears as impossible within a certain ideological social space. It's yes, you are right. It is impossible, but look, see, look at us and learn. We will do the impossible. <laughs>
And I still feel that strongly. I still feel very much that that is where communism is. That is what communism is. Why? I think firstly, because the garden grew out of a no. Grew out of a yeah, basta, yeah, we can't go on. We can't go on living in this capitalist world. We can't go on creating and recreating capitalism because it is destroying us, and it is destroying us very quickly. We have to break the logic. We have to break the logic of capitalism, and we have to do it now, not in some far-off day in the future. And that is the starting point of the garden, was just a refusal that enough, no, we can't go on. But that refusal, that rage became transformed into a process of creation. In other words, it's not just a negation, it's a negation and a creation, not just an against, it's an against and beyond. The transformation of rage into a, into a change here and now in the city of Athens. And this change seems to be crucial in two respects. Firstly, by being a garden, it announces that what we need is not just a change in our own social relations, but also a change in our relation with other forms of life, with non-human forms of life. In other words, a garden has the special feature of saying, of saying that any anti-capitalism, any communism must be based on the different relation with the plants and animals that surround us. And secondly, it's crucial in this garden that the, 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 the whole process is create, creates a different set of social relations. It's a process of creating a no-go area, if you like, creating a crack in the logic of capitalist social cohesion. The people involved in the park put up, they don't in fact, but symbolically you can imagine them putting up signs around the garden saying, capital, keep out. Here we are going to create something different. Here we are creating something according to a different logic. Here we are not going to measure land according to the price per square meter. Here we are going to appreciate land by the pleasure it gives to us and our children. <laughs> so these non-capitalist, it seems to me that they are non-capitalist social relations, non-capitalist in the sense that they break with the logic of capital, that they consciously create relations that are asymmetrical in relation to capitalism, relations of horizontality, relations of cooperation, relations of friendship, of love, if you like, relations that do not fit in to the logic of capital. So you've got the creation then in this area of a communal structure something that develops and take, takes up and develops the whole communal tradition of anti-capitalism. The whole way in which the movement has always tried to develop, to, 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 to organize itself, to um, find forms of taking decisions that are horizontal, that involve everybody in the struggle of capitalism. So you could think of the garden as a space of communal the communism then exists. It is not in the far off future because we don't know if there's going to be a far off future. Communism exists and it exists in the interstices of capitalism. That's where it exists. And it exists in the interstices of capital as an interstitial group in, against, and beyond capital. 
And that it's always, <laughs> and that it's always right. contradictory. And of course there are problems, and of course there are conflicts, and of course the people who run the garden have the problem of how do they keep out the police, how do they deal with drug addicts, how do they deal with drug dealers? How do they actually create and maintain it as a real communal space? But it seems to me that there is no other way we can think about revolution. That the only possible way we can think about revolution is as the creation, expansion, multiplication, and confluence of such communist spaces, of such cracks in the texture of capitalism domination. And it seems ridiculous, it seems ridiculous and you begin to think that in fact this Navarino Park isn't just a kind of tiny local example. Uh, Slavoj would probably like me to say uh, my, but it is actually something that exists all over the place. That all over the place we People create spaces, they create no-go areas, they create areas in which they say, no, here capital will not come in. Here we are going to develop our lives according to a different logic. And if you go to the southeast of Mexico, or if you go to Chiapas, to the Zapatist area, all around the Zapatist area there are signs saying, bad government, stay out. Here the people rule. But it's something that you can imagine in Navarino Park, as I said. It's something that exists around occupied factories. It's something that exists in the peace It's something that we all do. It's something that we all do in our relations with our children, in our relations with our loved ones. We say, capital, keep out. Here we are doing something else. Here we are de developing different social relations. And when you begin to think of it like that, you begin to see that the world is not simply a world of domination. That the world is actually a world of cracks, a world of interstitial communism. So perhaps communism isn't a word. It isn't in fact communism. What you have is perhaps not communism, but communizing. A process of communizing in which people are co trying to communize the society in many different ways. The only communism that we could really talk about, I suppose, in any full sense, would be a world system in which we all participated in determining our own lives. But for the moment, at least for the moment, all we have is these movements, these movements from the particular, these movements of communizing, of communization, if you like. And to talk of experiences like that, to talk about in terms of communizing, I hope makes it clear because I'm not thinking of micro politics. It is not just the local, it is not just the garden. But if you think, it seems to me that it doesn't help to think of those spaces as autonomous spaces because autonomous spaces imply something self contained, that they are cracks, and cracks move, and cracks run, and cracks shoot out in all directions. Cracks come together. And they come together in ways that we can often not, uh, not anticipate and not organize. So to think of radical social change, thoroughgoing change, we need to think of a confluence of cracks. But the question is, the problem is that we don't have any model for talking about this confluence. We can say, obviously, that the confluence of the cracks, the coming together of the cracks, requires some form of sort of organization. But this sort of organization is not institutionalization because institutionalization doesn't work. And the institutionalization doesn't work because uh, the cracks by their nature are the th are thresholds are opening to different uh, to a different sort of society, to different sorts of social relations. And the institutionalization is always the imposition of the present upon the future. And that is why, in fact, institutions never work, it seems to be, as a way of promoting the confluence of practice. How do we organize the revolution? As Raoul Sibeki says, 
we can't organize a revolution. In fact, we can't organize a rebellion. A rebellion is a movement that nobody controls. What we can do is try and strengthen it. What we can do is try and promote these cracks, try and create and expand these cracks. But we can't actually, we can't institutionalize them, we can't organize them. And that is the answer to Savoy's question about Abel Morales. In Bolivia between 2000 and 2005, we had a huge explosion of cracks, a huge explosion of communizing. And what the election of Morales did was to for channeling that communizing process into its logical opposite, in other words, into state forms of organization, and in many ways to, 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 to bring that, to, that process to a closure. Not completely, of course, because it's very contradictory. But that is what institutionalization does. It kills cracks. Communism, communizing, and statification are processes that move opposite directions. So then what? How do we promote the, how do we think about the confluence of practice? How do we think about strengthening the communizing process?